there's this thing people do where shame comes up about something that happened, something they said or did, makes them feel embarrassed or ashamed. And instead of feeling that, instead of allowing themselves to you know, think about that, they make this little switch. And I call this shame shifting. Now, maybe you've done this before. I definitely have. Y you feel this pang of shame and then so quickly, you don't even know you felt it, you switch to blame. And your mind finds someone or something whose fault it is that you're having a hard time. You shift from shame about yourself to blame of somebody else. Boom. Now, right, you're not ashamed, you're mad. And when you've been through a lot of trauma, feeling angry is like medicine sometimes. It's a step up from the lowest moods of depression and shame or hopelessness even. And our minds don't need a lot of reasons to be angry and to blame other people for our problems. Now, sure, sometimes other people are responsible for our problems, but it can go overboard with shame shifting. That well of shame is like gasoline on the fire of anger. It makes no sense. It's over the top. It's destructive. It's not fair. And you've probably had it done to you too. It's crazy making, right? You get accused of something that's like, what? I didn't say that. You just want me to feel, they say. You never loved me. You think you're better than me. Someone is feeling all these things and they think that you are making them feel that way. And you'll find that when people are making unreasonable accusations, what they're really doing is trying to deflect some shame. Now their shame might be from, you know, like imaginary sources. It might be something they actually legitimately feel ashamed about, who knows? When they're being hard on you in some way that doesn't quite feel right to you, or they're just so resentful about something, some family thing, something in the news that concerns them, there's a very good chance what's making their anger get that huge like that is a well of bad feelings they have about in some way letting themselves down actually. So they blame you or they blame people today. They're all like this, they're all like that. They blame anything, anybody else. Now I've noticed generally that when people feel like they've let themselves down, it's a vulnerable moment and it's very tempting to lash out at other people. Letting yourself down feels terrible. So like, you know, maybe you were late to work, so you get lost in thoughts about how the place you work is so crappy. Or you had a bad argument in front of your kids and you get furious at your partner for scaring the kids. Or you eat a whole thing of ice cream and get mad at your roommate for buying ice cream. So one place I see shame shifting is when people try to explain why they struggle to keep friends. And they say things like, people are just so selfish these days. I see this in the comments quite a lot, really. And I can see plainly that in our comment section alone, there are thousands of caring, unselfish people. And I can't help but think that people who say everyone is so terrible or everyone they know is a narcissist would have to have an element of shame shifting going on. It can feel easier to blame everyone for why friendships aren't working out. But if all my friendships aren't working out, I probably have something to do with it. And things can only get better if I can face myself honestly and try to get some insight about how I might be pushing people away or choosing badly or whatever it is. There's a core shame a lot of us feel that the bad things that happened to us in the past were our fault. And and our parents may have told us that, right? You kids, you make my life miserable and I have to drink because of you, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And kids who don't get loved properly by their parents very often internalize responsibility for that. In kid logic, it makes sense. But of course, when we're talking about parents abusing or neglecting their children, the parents are to blame, clearly. Yes, they might be stressed. Yes, they might have been abused themselves or struggling with their mental health at the time, or they were drunk or high, or for whatever reason, they couldn't stand up for you or see that you needed protection. But they're still responsible. They had to know that what they were doing is wrong, but they did it anyway. Now, if this happened to you when you were small, the trauma was so far beyond your control, there's nothing you could have done to stop it, nothing you could have done to prevent all the harm it later caused in your life to the family, to you, to your emotions, to your neurology, the harm was done. 
but you are not to blame for what happened. And if you haven't internalized that yet, I'm here to help you acknowledge it. You are not to blame for what happened to you. The people who hurt you, they are to blame for that. Now, until you get that in your bones, you might be coping with it by putting a lot of energy into blame. Blame people, blame politicians, blame countries, blame the weather, blame whatever. Blame keeps you from recognizing where your power lies. And it's a kind of learned helplessness. But the reason I want to go a little deeper into the subject of blame is that it has a tendency to fester, to sit there. And without any healing, it can spread and start infecting other parts of your life and your memories. So I had an older brother who died, gosh, 29 years ago. And that was the same year my mother died, but it was about six months later. He was 38 at that time. I was 31 and his name was Jeffrey. And his body just gave out at the age of 38 from years of drugs and alcohol abuse. He was into heroin, heroin and booze mostly. I don't talk about him very much because he was a difficult person. I have harsh memories of it. He caused a lot of pain for me. He was abusive, although, you know, there were good times. You probably have those people in your life too. He was funny. He was smart. He loved magic tricks and he always gave family members magic tricks for Christmas. And that was pretty fun, but he was really, really sick and he couldn't hold down a job. He got into fights and car wrecks. He hurt animals on purpose. He was thrown in jail a bunch of times for being drunk and disorderly. And he'd clean up a little in rehab sometimes for a short time, and then he couldn't sustain it, and he'd fall back into his addictions. So he was strongly motivated to try to keep the family together, I remember. And that was a positive intention that he had. But he made all family gatherings so incredibly stressful, sometimes violent. So it was hard to have any kind of relationship with him not just because of the erratic craziness of the drugs and drinking, but because he was just so obsessed with why he was like this. And specifically, what our mother had done to make him this way. And he talked about himself all the time to the point that he was completely like in his own world. And in his mind, you know, nobody else had problems. He had problems, so many of them, with money, jobs, girlfriends, getting along with people. He nearly died in a motorcycle accident one time that left him in a coma for four months. He was hammered drunk when this happened. But he believed that all of this was our mother's fault. And he said he did all this acting out to show her how it felt to watch her, you know, be an alcoholic and act out. And I just thought, well, that's really stupid. And I told him so. <laughs> what good would it do? My mother had her faults, including big faults. And because she was an alcoholic, she wasn't able to take care of us very consistently. And I have childhood PTSD, and clearly my brother did too. But my brother would say over and over again, I just need her to admit what she did, and then I'll be able to get clean and sober. He didn't just believe that she held the key to his sobriety. It's all he ever talked about. And honestly, it was a real drag when he'd start in on this. I spent a lot of my youth really angry at my mom, but even I could see he was being irrational. Everyone knows that getting sober is an inside job. It's something a person has to do themselves, no matter where the pain in their lives came from. You know, that, that, that's the only place where there's control over that. There's nothing another person can say or do to make sobriety happen. Take it from me. <laughs> Honestly, from my point of view, I saw them both. My mom and brother as really difficult people. And the more I've recovered from my own problems, the more I see them as just another couple of alcoholics, who were powerless to stop their drinking and drugs. And for whatever reason, you know, kind of different for each of them, they just couldn't recover. And they both died early as a result. And it's a mystery why some people can recover and others can't or don't seem to want to recover. It seems like it. So I can't speak for my mother, but my brother talked with me a lot about the hardships of his life with me. And it's true. I was there. We were both neglected and he was outright physically abused. But in his 30s, he was just basically hurting everyone around him. He'd steal my babysitting money when I was 11 and he was 18. I had to stop the car in a big intersection once because he was punching my sister because she said no to his demands that we drive him to buy heroin. We, you know, she's like, no, no. <laughs> and then this violence started. And I could tell you stories and stories and stories, but they're horrible. And he had a list of 
a hundred excuses and these grievance stories he'd tell again and again and again. And before I started learning how to recover, I also made excuses for myself and blamed people for my problems. I mean, that takes a long time to heal from, you know, to start getting some clarity. But before I had any clarity there, you know, still the difference between him and me was I learned about alcoholism from literature and recovered alcoholics. And I learned that I couldn't change my mom and that in fact, she couldn't change herself. And it was so freeing, you know, to just knowing that she didn't ask to be an alcoholic, just like I didn't ask to have CPTSD, but here we were. Of course, there was no name for CPTSD back then. I was just considered crazy. <laughs> but I think she had terrible shame about her drinking and that's why we never spoke openly about it. She didn't apologize. She didn't take responsibility. And it was tragic and it hurt us kids, but it wasn't personal. You know, she had a lot of trouble in her life because of her drinking. And, you know, my troubles from her drinking have ended long ago and I was able to get on and have a life. So yeah, but she suffered, she suffered to the end. And when I really got that, I felt a lot less blame. And this is kind of how that works. I felt less shame, less shame about myself. So everybody is damaged to one degree or another, and I'm not trying to minimize actual abuse, but I'm sure you've noticed, you know, everyone is flawed. And it's easy to think, even as we sit in our own shortcomings, that if we were in another person's shoes, we would be so much different, we'd be so much better. But there are people who probably say that about us. <laughs> and it would be just speculation and just as arrogant, really, to think, oh, you know, if I were Anna, I'd know how to live her life better. It's probably not true. Now, people usually know on some level that they're screwing up. I know when I am. And through the years I've been healing from trauma, there's this little sensor in my heart that gets more and more sensitive. When I'm screwing up, something feels wrong. And healing has helped me be clearer now that when something feels wrong that way, I need to stop and get it right. But I didn't always have that. I'd blunder along and walk all over people's feelings. And the wrong feeling I had back then, I'd shame shift. I'd blame other people for making me so sad or mad or lonely or embarrassed. So I get it about alcoholics in my family. They're responsible for what they did, but in another way, they aren't to blame. Who is to say that if I had the same DNA and the same experiences, that I wouldn't be just like anyone else who struggles worse than I do? Maybe it's not even my brother's fault that he just couldn't stop doing drugs and, and, and he couldn't stop thinking my mom would one day change and then he would be happy. He did think he was changing the summer after our mother died. He said he felt hopeful that he could finally, you know, feel free to get free, to get sober, to finish school and get a good career. But by October of that year, six months after my mother died, he died too. So the year the two of them died was the year that I was shown the daily practice, writing my fears and resentments on paper, asking for them to be removed, and then meditating, doing this routine twice a day. And it helped me get free of my own blame scenarios and my shame so that I could see what needed fixing in my own life. To have that clarity is so incredibly powerful. And that is what empowered me to get to work on changing my life. It's no small thing to heal from the past, but it's nice not to think about the past so much, you know? <laughs> it's nice not to feel angry about what happened and just to have space, to have a life, to be in present time, to feel free. So I'm free to try to shape my life in good ways, and I do try to do that. And mostly what interests me now is showing other people how to get free too. And that's what I hope I'm sharing with you now. You can heal shame and you can have your life back. And if you're interested, I teach those techniques for free, the techniques that, got, that helped me with that. It's a little course called The Daily Practice. It's down in the description section below all my videos. It's on the website, it's on the free tools page, it's on the courses page. Like, forgive me, I'm just putting it out there all the time. Like, this is really simple, it's free. If you sign up for it, you can join free Zoom calls with me that I run twice a month, which are lovely. We use the techniques together, I answer questions. When you're born to sick people who can't care for you properly or protect you from harm, and when their behavior brings attack and shame on the family, it is only natural for you to believe as a child, not necessarily that you're to blame for their behavior, some kids will think that, 
But you might believe that the shame that hangs over the family that's directed at the adults is yours too. And people are cruel and careless that way. They blame the kids and outsiders who should know better judge the kids. They allow bullying to be directed at the kids. But of course, the children are innocent. And that shame that the kids are drowning in eventually gets the better of them. It gets inside. I had that. And maybe you've had that too. And I'm telling you, you can make a lot of progress on healing your trauma, but that shame can be very hard to reach. And it has a way of attracting more hardship in this weird way. It just, it drives you towards self-defeating behaviors and it can make you a bully magnet. And you think, I swore I'd never make this mistake again. I don't want people to judge me, but here I am doing it again. Now everybody's gonna like come after me again. Why am I doing this? It runs so deep because it got in there before you had words or any kind of reference point to know that you're innocent. And that bad feeling of being ashamed of your parents, it was a correct feeling to feel ashamed of them, but it wasn't your shame. It's a sludgy, sticky poison like an oil spill that got into you. When you're kind of vibing at that energy, people sense it in you and you internalize it. You internalize it because of what happened, because of the way people react to you, and it starts to be this vicious circle. But you can heal. You can become your real self. And I want to talk about that today. I got a letter recently from someone I'll call Jennifer, and she writes, Dear Anna, I listen to you every day to try to chip away at this big boulder that I'm carrying with me. I'm seeing a therapist on and off but this is costly and I'm saving so that my kids and I can move. So doing a lot of work on my own. If you could please offer your perspective, here goes. All right, I've got the fairy pencil ready to circle things. I'm gonna read all the way through, then I'll come back and we'll talk about things that I circled. All right, Jennifer says, I was born from an affair. My father was married to someone else and my mom was divorced from an abusive relationship. There was always alcohol involved when they were together and lots of secrecy, but everybody knew about it. And it was almost like there was an agreement that I didn't know about that it has to be hidden in plain sight and people should just pretend there's nothing wrong with it. Mm, I know those agreements. Insert lots of confusion, Jennifer says. Mm -hmm. My dad's wife would come around to our house and throw bricks and stones at our windows and call my mother a whore. Wow. One time, everybody ran in and left me outside while my dad's wife and a gang of women threw rocks and abuse at our house. Eventually, they let me in. I used to dance and be involved in arts and culture at our school, but I was often so embarrassed or ashamed. Mm hmm Because both my parents would come there drunk. I was bullied, too, for being different and for pretending I was the bee's knees. <laughs> I wish I knew what it is that I did to deserve to be bullied for having drunk parents born out of wedlock or shame brought on me and my family. My mother would become a monster when she drank, often telling me no one liked me, I'm a slut, and that she's going to put me in, in a home. Good God. My bags were often packed. I prayed to God to help me. At five or six, I was molested by my day mother's son. I didn't know that phrase day mother and I looked it up and it's, it's a home daycare. It's the woman who runs a home daycare. Her son abused you. Okay. Fast forward a few years at the age of 11, my dad died. I never knew he died or that he was buried. I heard two weeks later. Wow. I stopped the dance class, but the bullying continued. I started developing and dressing up. My mother would often just give me the evil eye. Boys were taking interest and there was one particular older guy that looked like he could rescue me. He took advantage of me sexually and I lost my virginity. I never saw him again. High school, more bullying. At age 15, I fell pregnant and had my daughter at 16. My life has just been a mess. 11 years ago, I had my son, the best experience of my life. My daughter and I had moved in with my boyfriend and we were supposed to get married. When I was pregnant, I took such great care of my body. I was conscious of making good decisions for the baby I was carrying. I wanted to give him the best possible start, but things started changing. I developed a colon issue. Both my brothers-in-law died within a year of each other. I told my boyfriend at the time that I needed more from him and that he has to try to limit the drinking since I didn't want my kids to be around that anymore. There it is. He told me he couldn't give me what I want and that's 
what started the ball rolling in us separating. We sold everything and went our separate ways amongst fights in court, custody, maintenance, and threats. There's so much more to the story, but I'm afraid I might trigger people too much. Darlin. I lost everything. I had to move back home and have been trying for seven years to get back on my feet. My throat closes every time I want to put myself first. I'm not living. There are days I can't move and there are loops playing over and over in my head about how useless I am and that I should never have left my ex. I feel like I'm in a self-constructed courtroom where a part of me has decided that I deserve to be punished for all the harm I've caused. I'm on antidepressants, trying to eat healthy and function as a parent and woman. I'm failing miserably, just ask my ex. My job doesn't bring me joy either, so it's like there's no respite. There's a part of me that I've encountered that doesn't believe I'm broken, yet the powerful bullying aspect of me insists that I need to heal because I'm broken. How do I resolve this? My life depends on it, and so do my kids' lives. I want to do this for them and for me, and I'm sure they're tired of seeing their mother beaten down. I am too. I appreciate your assistance, guidance, and support, Jennifer. All right. You are my kind of woman, Jennifer. I relate to you a lot, and I believe in you. And the very first thing I want to say is all the harm you've caused, you didn't tell me about any harm. You didn't tell me anything. And, you know, I think that the fact that you're eating healthy and trying to be a good mom and reaching out for help and watching YouTube to try to find out how to heal is all the right things. Let's see if we can find the next steps for you to take it another level. You're doing great. What you went through is so unimaginably horrible. I get it. I've been shamed before. I was ashamed of stuff that happened in my childhood. But I don't think it, you know, didn't come to actual stoning. And I just think it's so interesting. I don't know if you know this, but... Uh, there was a woman in the Bible who is stoned for adultery. That is what they were doing to your mom. It was a, it was a death penalty, right? It's somebody is irredeemable when they've done that. In the Bible, it turns out differently because mercy arrives and the world is introduced to a new way of looking at people who have made mistakes. Now, it's hard for me to have sympathy for your mom right now, um, but she was an alcoholic and I know what that's like. I had an alcoholic mom too and alcoholics say things. Alcoholics have their emotional development, their, the maturity needed to raise a kid and like uh, filter, have a filter on when they're feeling overwhelmed or exhausted with parenting and all the responsibilities and probably this crap job that she had, I'm guessing, that it was all very hard and she had no filter and she blamed you and it's, you know, it's terrible. I'm not trying to excuse it. But I just see how all of this works. There's like everyone in this story is merciless. And now you are merciless to yourself. You were born from an affair. Actually, your mom and your biological father may have been having an affair, but you were born from pure goodness. You are real. You're a human being exactly like all human beings. You are not marked by their behavior. Okay. I just want to make that so clear. I want you to have mercy on yourself. You are a full beautiful flower lotus of a human being exactly like you should be nothing about what they did actually infects who you are all right there was alcohol involved when they were together so they hung out they had this secret relationship you know i had a family with a secret uh, dynamic in there people in my family were selling drugs in the house and like i was one of two people maybe three <laughs> who didn't realize what was going on, who was just always, it was like so crazy making. It's like, what's going on? Why are these people in the house? What's this weird secret language? Why does everybody itch so bad? And it was crazy making. And it took me years to kind of realize what was going on is there was heavy drug use. There was drug dealing. There was a lot of denial about it by those of us who weren't involved in it. And it was kept secret from those of us who weren't involved because they knew that we would disapprove. And people who are in the middle of their addiction do not want to be messed with. They don't want the interference. And so, you know, they will basically go to any lengths, including just be completely destructive to people's faith and trust in them, to the safety of the kids, to keep going. And I'm, you know, it's sad, but it is part of the disease of addiction. And it's interesting, like, I'm, it's dawning on me. I get all these letters. I get a lot of letters, like, way more than I can actually read. And so many of them involve an alcoholic parent. And I had, I had an alcoholic parent. I had two, actually. I knew it was bad, but as I start to feel the relatedness to 
to my brothers and sisters out here, to you, my sister. Like, I just, you help me realize, like, it's not my fault either. It's not my fault either. And as much as I know intellectually, like, I didn't do that, the things that happened in my home, that it didn't affect me. I've done all the practical work that I've done so far in my life and I carry on, I keep doing it. I do my daily practice every day. I hope you know about that. I'll talk about this in this video. But I like daily just sit there working to shed the fearful and resentful thoughts and beliefs and reactions to things. Not so that I can have nothing in my mind, but so that I can have like clear thinking come back in and inform me so that I can take strong actions, so that I can be lucid so that I can stop being driven by confusion about like, if everybody's like bullying and shaming me, and I had that happen as an adult, <sighs> when that's happening, it's pretty hard to stay clear. Like, do I deserve this? And I'll tell, I'll give you a short answer. On some level, I had really messed up. I had made a mistake. I'm not gonna go into it in this video, but I'll just say, I made a big moral mistake. People were shaming me. That was pretty much their bad moral behavior. I sorted out my problem. It was never healed between all of us and I just got away from those people. But people can be cruel like that. Um, and the, this thing, so what really hurts me in your story, they threw bricks and stones at your windows. They called your mom a whore. Um, one time everybody ran, they ran in and left you outside and there it is. That's like the great abandonment. That is just so alcoholic. That's active alcoholism at work, you know, just forget the kid. Finally, they let you in. You must have been terrified. I can see how their bad thing got in you. I'm so sorry that happened to you. That never should have happened. You have kids now. I have kids. We never would have left our kids outside, would we? No. No. So good for you. You've healed. I, and when you say that, you, you know, just to ask your kid's dad how you're doing a terrible job, I'm guessing that means that you're having a hard time keeping their environment stable, positive, structured, you know, nutritious, all that stuff, being a good mom. I found that hard too. I found it hard too. And I found something I've been thinking about lately is how scary it is when you're around people who are highly functional and you're struggling, how you end up avoiding those people because of fear of their judgment. And I think that, I think that that, if anything, well, there may, I don't know, bullying is a funny thing. Once a kid has been bullied by their parents or, or even just by kids at school, there's some weird injury that happens to your, you know, to your vibe that people continue to bully you. You become a bully magnet. And I can't totally explain why that happens, but one of the reasons is, is because of that avoidance. Like you don't seek out the decent people. And if anybody who has no friends and who's isolated at school, and that's what it sounded like, I'm so glad you found the dance and everything, at least until your dad died when you were 11. So you had these pursuits that gave you joy and those give you resilience. They helped you survive getting sexually assaulted as a kid, but you gave it up and that's what we do. We avoid the nice people. It just becomes like, it feels too different. That's my opinion. I'm exploring this more. I'll do a video about it soon. That avoidance of the, of the people who have it together. Somebody sent me a message about this today. Um, just a, like a one-on-one -on -one message on Instagram who just said they had had a breakthrough that this is what it is. And I'm like, gosh, it is just like that. That is what it is. And the question becomes when you have been avoiding people who have it together, it's like, well, what am I avoiding? This acquaintance who wrote to me today had said, well, the parents do it. The parents avoid decent people to be in the family's life because they need to be around people who aren't going to judge their shitty parenting. And I think that's true. But I could also say that I think to some degree I've done the same thing in my life, not just as a parent, but also especially like when I was in high school and I just kind of sought out the people who were drug addicts. Even though I wasn't a drug addict, it was safer for me to be with people who couldn't be on some kind of high horse with my failures or my perceived failures. Because I actually like, I'm telling you as a kid, and I think you were too, I was a good kid. I was a good kid. I was just carrying a lot of shame. I totally understand that. You couldn't really bring friends home because it was too weird. It was just too, too weird. And so this thing where they bullied you for being different and for pretending you were the bee's knees, I don't know what you mean by different, but I do know kids do bully the crap out of people who are perceived as different. And if you are kind of um, isolated from other kids, 
you end up having, you find a way to use your imagination or your creativity, which you did through dance. I was really into books. And then I was really into, um, I would act things out in our little like aluminum shed in the backyard. I created a little school and the neighborhood little kids would come to my school and I would pretend I was like Laura Ingalls Wilder teaching school. My fantasies were great, but I had to play with kids younger than me because I couldn't really deal with kids my own age. And I perceived that they didn't want to be friends with me. But looking back and actually knowing some of them now, I'm like, I think that I also, I, I was protecting myself and pulling away. You can ask yourself if that was part of it. Um, it makes sense. It makes sense. But, but perhaps there's a, more of an opening with other people than you realize. That's all I'm trying to like give you is like, yeah, part of that was was not necessarily, it wasn't that everybody hated you. It sounds like there were some terrible people. They called you a slut. Yes, I had that too. And, um, and then your mom, oh, it was your mom. No, I didn't have that. Your mom would become a monster when she drank, often telling you no one likes you, you're a slut, and that she's going to put you in a home. You know, it's so weird. Like, so I write my fears and resentments every day. Those would be my fears if I had been writing them at the time. But it really happened to you, sweetheart. That is just so wrong. No mom should do that. I'm amazed. Here you are. You're momming now. You got this, all right? You are not her. And her behavior is just terrible. Like, she really put a big project on you to try to survive that and then to, like, recover yourself one day. But you can, okay? You can recover yourself. Your real self is intact in there, and you can, you can, you can come back. You can come back out, all right? It's going to be a project, but it's a happy project. And I'm really happy that you, you wrote, okay? All right, so you prayed to God to help, all right? At five or six, you were molested by the son of the day mother. Very vulnerable age. It happened to a lot of us, I'm afraid. It's hard. Yeah. Fast forward a few years. At the age of 11, your dad died. And that's a very, you know, your dad sounds like a schmuck. And he didn't take care of you. And they didn't even tell you that he died. So I guess you weren't important to him or nobody else perceived that you were. I don't know. That's so wrong. So it sounds like your mom, yeah, he was the only father figure in your life, right? But he was just somebody who got drunk and attracted bricks to the house. And people didn't see you as a real person who lost her dad. You didn't have that reality. And you did lose your dad. You, you lost your dad well before he died, you know, through his alcoholism, through his indifference, through his, you know, dishonest life through his um, involving your mom in trouble that caused all this damage for you. Like, no good dad does that, all right? Not a good dad. So he died and you didn't know. It's like, oh, who cares about her, right? Um, you stopped dancing and the bullying. And you, it's interesting you phrase that. I stopped dancing, but the bullying continued. So was that what was different about you? Was that you danced? Were you too creative, too lovely, too genuine? Dumb kids, kids can be so mean. You started developing and dressing up and your mother would often just give you the evil eye and boys were taking an interest and there was one particular older guy. Of course, I hope you're not ashamed. This is like when a kid is not parented. I've heard, I'd like to see this validated. I've heard that girls who don't grow up with their biological dad around will go into puberty earlier, sometimes as much as two years earlier than a girl who grows up in the physical presence of his dad. So people out there, you can check this for me. I would like to see more research about it. But I get it. It sounds like a biological adaptation so that um, a girl, uh, you know, maybe from, you know, hundreds, uh, tens of thousands of years ago, it's an adaptation so that a girl can get cared for, like married off young. You go into puberty early. Early puberty without the psychological maturity is a locus of all kinds of hell. <laughs> they, they're, they're not supposed to be so close together. And, you know, 130 years ago, it wasn't. I think the average age of a woman's first period was 17. And now it's more like 11 and sometimes much younger. And, you know, there's just been a lot of talk. Why is it so much younger? And it may be to do with a lot of things, but one of the reasons might be not having that physical presence of your dad. Your body knows who your dad is. Your body knows and your body's uh, endocrine structures are responsive to the people in your life and what's going on. Another disruptor of this is sexual abuse. So you were put through the ringer on levels that you had no 
insight into or control over and that were not respected by anybody around you or protected. And that's why, you know, this is intuitive to people who are sober and healed enough to raise kids conscientiously that you would just never want, it, it, just like you would do anything to protect them from being publicly shamed or abused in any way, because you instinctively can feel about your kids that they are so fragile and that their sense of safety is so primally important. You can't protect kids from everything. St stuff happens, I know. And I bet your kids, I know my kids, you know, they've had to deal with some problems. And some of those problems were for me, you know, me, um, I had huge medical problems. I had a really like fighting relationship with their dad and, you, you know, stuff happened that I regret very much that they were exposed to. But I, but like all parents, I I got to, you know, work on it and 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 make good on it and provide that structure for them and be present in their life and see to their needs, as, you know, pretty well. You've heard that concept of good enough mother. So let's aim at that. OK, good enough mother. So there was an older guy who looked like he could rescue you. I bet he did. OK, he took advantage of me sexually and I lost my virginity. It sounds like you were quite young. Never saw him again. Then you say high school. So that sounds like it happened in middle school. That's way too young. I'm so sorry. You had no protection. Nobody looking after you. High school, more bullying. At the age of 15, I fell pregnant and I had my daughter at 16. <sighs> Especially given your home situation, I can only imagine how hard that was and what an incredible load of responsibility it was on you to try to deal with the bullying and the chaos of your mom. Um, I assume you lived with her, but I don't even know that. You never saw the guy again, this older guy. But later you had your son and that was a great experience because, yeah, you were more mature and prepared for it. And at the time, your daughter and you had moved in with your boyfriend and you were supposed to get married. When you were pregnant, you took such great care of your body. So that's what I'm hearing. This came up a couple times. Like, it's a happy thing for you is when you take care of your body. And I'm not going to let you forget that. This is, a, this is something you feel really good about. It puts you on your track. So that's one of the things that we're going to come back to and say, when you take care of your body, you feel good. You start to know the goodness of you and you become more capable. So it sounds like you have trouble caring for your body. And you didn't say why. I don't know what it is, whether it's food or you know, weed or alcohol yourself, I don't know. But you wanted to give your baby a, a great start. And um, you wanted to do the best you could, so good. You had the baby and things started changing. You developed a colon issue. Both your, my, you said both my brothers-in-law died within a year of each other. And you told your boyfriend at the time that I needed more from him. So you said you needed more from him and he didn't come through. That part, okay. It sounds like it was sort of like a shaky situation. And, uh, you know, when, when you have a baby, you really do need more from your partner. You do. And many of us have had to do without it, but you needed more. But here's where you tipped your hand. And this was interesting that it was sort of couched in there. I told him I needed more from him. You said, try to limit the drinking since I didn't want my kids to be around that anymore. And he told you he couldn't give you what, what you wanted. And that's what started the ball rolling in us separating. So I'm just saying it here. I think you know this, but you didn't even ask him to stop drinking. Although probably I'm guessing that would, that's, the, that's the only thing that would have made a difference. You just said, could he limit it? And could he be there more for you? And it caused the relationship to break down. So because of what you went through, I hear you going, oh, look, I caused this. You know, I should have like tolerated it or something. Look what I put us through. But you know... You didn't want your kids to go through that again. And they would have gone through that again. I don't, I don't know. It does, I, you're not saying that you, they had, there was that level of abuse and like extreme, you know, selfish neglect that, you, that your parents dumped on you. But growing up with alcoholism, it's really hard. And so I see your vision that you were going to try to do something better. And doing it on your own sometimes is, is better than doing it with an alcoholic who's not there for you. So I can see why you made that choice. And I can also understand your question about maybe you were just, I don't know, avoidant or something. Because I'll tell you what, 
I'll tell you what, my brothers and sisters, when you are treated like, like this, it is hard to connect with somebody and form a stable relationship. A few people get right into it. The rest of us have to grow a little bit into it. All right, so you're growing and that can come, but you were young and you had two little kids. Oh my God, the pressure, I know. So I got divorced from my first marriage when my kids were one and four. But I was already, I was, I was 40 years old, you know, like I knew a lot and I was able to earn enough money, enough to get by. And, uh, but that was still like, that was a shocking and devastating abandonment and very hard to deal with, even though it was totally the right thing and allowed me to, to put my life together in a much better way over time. Okay. I want to put that out there for you. You can do it too. All right. So you sold everything, went separate ways. And there were fights, courts, custody, maintenance, and threats. There's so much more. Yeah, you don't want to trigger people. That's so thoughtful. I can imagine, though. And you lost everything. So you had no material things. And you had to move back home. Home! Oh, my gosh. You had to move back home. And you've been trying for seven years to get back on your feet. You said, my throat closes up every time I want to put myself first. So, you know, that's a very telling symptom that your throat closes. Uh, that sounds like a real physicalization of being silenced anytime you expressed your needs. I'm not very magical woo woo about this stuff, but if your throat closes, that is a somaticization of feeling that you can't express yourself every time you try to put yourself first. Well, of course you have to put yourself first. You're the mom. One thing good about kids is that sometimes things that you would not do on your own behalf, you see that it must be done for their sake. Now, sometimes people are too far gone. They can't do it for the kids, but you can, Jennifer, you can. You can put yourself first and the well-being of your kids. You can put it all first. Seven years. So here's the thing. You're not the first person who ended up moving home with the parents who abused them. And every time it happens, my heart just bleeds for people because it is so devastating to recovery. I totally get that you're in a situation that you cannot get on your feet right now. And what you're describing, um, I know you've been to therapy on and off and they may have told you, but it sounds to me like depression and I don't blame you at all that you have depression. You're having trouble. You can't move. You have thoughts about being useless. You've decided that you deserve to be punished for all the harm you've caused. I don't know what you've caused. That's where I started. I don't know what you've caused. Um, you're on antidepressants. You're trying to eat healthy and function as a parent and a woman. Failing miserably. No, you know what? You are an example to us all of a person who works to hang in there and raise the kids well and get a roof over their head and do what she needs to do to protect herself and her kids despite everything that happened to her. Okay? So I'm just going to remind you that. I want you to do everything you can to keep shifting your identity off of your mother's idea of you to the idea that me and everybody in this community, and I hope everybody's going to pour love at you. I know they will. They're going to let you know how good you are and how deserving and worthy you are and um, help remind you, just help remind you that that's who you really are. You were never this idea of your mother's. You're a precious child born innocent who survived a very tough situation. So you, you have dark thoughts. So in my approach to healing, what those dark thoughts are that I'm, you know, I'm worthless. Um, I, I'm useless. I should never have left my ex. We call those fears. So twice a day for 28 years now, I write my fears and resentments on paper. There's a free, a free course. It takes less than an hour to learn and try my techniques. I started doing these 28 years ago and so quickly did they start to lift the burden of the terrible thoughts I was in and the depression and the PTSD symptoms. You know, if you have CPTSD and you must, right? It is so hard to get your thoughts in a, in a line, you know, to sit there and do get, get a to-do list and then take systematic action on things. But guess what? If you can learn to re-regulate, because what happens is neurological dysregulation. That's what happens when you're neglected and abused. It's really normal. You sound like you have what I have. You know, you're this creative, charming girl. And uh, it gets really hard to like, you know, put one foot in front of the other. Uh, you lose your train of thought. You start something, you can't finish it. Something upsets you and just everything blows out for a few days. You can't do anything, you can't get up. You have what I have, okay? And there is hope. You can heal these symptoms. You can learn to re-regulate. There's a number of things you can do. 
um, and the most powerful one for me and that this whole channel exists for me to share is what I call the daily practice. Um, fears and resentments go on paper. There's a, it's a written process and then resting in meditation. Now you might say, I have kids. I can't do that. I did it with kids. It's totally worth it. And um, I've said it on this channel before. I, I, I got up earlier than them so that I could write and meditate in the morning, even though I was tired and I needed sleep. Writing and meditating would give me mind rest and energy that I wouldn't have had if I didn't get up early and write and meditate. Then in my evening writing and meditation, I don't know how old your kids are now. I think they're older than mine were, but I would put them in their high chairs. I'd put on SpongeBob. Do you know, I've never even watched SpongeBob. <laughs> I hear it's very funny. My kids loved it. So I'd let them watch an episode of SpongeBob for half an hour while I wrote and meditated. And they were, you know, one and four. And even the four-year-old had to go in a high chair so he couldn't like leave the room. And I would sit in the room and meditate. You can write and meditate even with SpongeBob on. <laughs> and they would get to have a little snack that wasn't choky and, uh, and watch SpongeBob. Now, some people would be like, oh, I would never let my kids watch TV. It's like, well, you weren't in my shoes. I'll let my kids watch TV. And I used it as a babysitter to, so that I could take care of my mental health. And I was able to climb up out of this. When I was first divorced, I didn't have nearly enough money to get by, but using my daily practice, I was able to like see a better idea and I was able to get that mental clutter out of my mind and that inner discouragement out of my mind for enough hours of the day to go, okay, you know what I need to do? I need to make some cold calls and I need to, um, I started consulting. I just knew like there was no job that would pay me enough to be able to support my kids and me. So I was like, I need to consult and charge twice as much. And I basically created this and they, it worked because I just, I just did the things but I never was able to take sustained action like that because of the dysregulation. I've always been intelligent. I can tell you are by your writing. I've been intelligent and capable and can do really good work, but dysregulated, I just can't even go get a job, you know? So the daily practice, the link is down below. It's on my free tools page on my website, crappychildhoodfairy.com, free tools. I'll also put the link down below for anybody who needs some help getting this crazy, you know, hamster thinking thing, just calm down for a while. It comes back. We're not trying to get rid of all of our thoughts or defenses or reactions. It's just a very healthy place where you can funnel out all those dark thoughts without having to always talk to somebody. I get it. You can't afford a therapist, but even if you could, you can't always wait for some appointment on Tuesday for what's happening on Friday, right? You need a way to feel better today. You need to feel a way to feel better at any time, sitting in the car, uh, sitting in the bathroom, hiding, <laughs> you know, <laughs> whatever it is, um, waiting for an appointment. You can always just sit there and use these techniques and kind of bring yourself back from that bad place. And so you don't have to change anything else about yourself. If you use these techniques, just start using them. This problem of not being able to get up, it can begin to shift. You can see. So you might sit there and be writing, you know, I'm resentful at myself because I have fear I can't get up out of bed and fear I'm going to ruin all my opportunities and fear I'm not going to be able to pay the rent and, and all those fears go on paper. It's not going to pay the rent for you, but what it's going to do is start bringing that fear down so that a clear thought of how to take action will go forward. So I think you probably have all the common sense suggestions for what a single mom can do to get back on her feet again and get an apartment. It's really hard when you're depressed and dysregulated. All right. It's really hard, but you can heal the fundamental symptoms that's driving that depression. That's the, the dysregulation is that core symptom. And when you start learning to, to stay regulated and be regulated more of the day, you can start to see what to do about problems. You can also avoid problems before you get into them. Wouldn't that be nice? Can't go back in time, but going forward, you can begin to uh, this is so much what CPTSD is like. You just don't have good sensors for like, wait, is this a good idea? Should I work here? Should I, should I take a day off from work to do this thing that I'd like to do? Or will that cause me to lose my job? Like neurologically, we're very bad at that. That's you. That's a measurable phenomenon. We can't predict like non-traumatized people, what the consequences of the certain things are. We also, there's so many things going on in the brain when we're triggered like that. So of course you have that, but as you calm it down, your good sense starts to get bigger than your dysregulation and you can start to 
make the choices that just keep putting the best interest of you and your kids in front, in front, in front. And next thing you know, you've walked a great distance and things get better. I'm here to tell you things can get much, much better. So what I'm talking about is good for anybody who feels paralyzed with depression, overwhelmed with the bad thoughts. Everybody, if it gets so bad that you feel like you got to hurt yourself or, you know, run away from your kids, please just get the professional help because it's there. And that's, that's, it's so good at that, right? To just get you through those. But in this hour, in this day, when you need help, I've got the technique that just might help you. Anybody who takes this free course or any of my courses, you get invited to, I do free Zoom calls with anybody who wants to come who knows the techniques. So you take the little course, you get an email from me, we do Zoom calls and we all do it together and I take questions. And so if anybody actually wants to talk to me, that's the place to do it. The other day I stayed on for three hours. I just, you know, when I can, I so enjoy connecting with people and talking one-on-one -on -one and helping people adopt these, these techniques. I want everybody in the world who could possibly benefit from them to recover as I did. And it doesn't cancel out anything else that you're doing that works for you. It can support whatever else you're doing that works for you. But I just think so many people simply don't have the money to do much else. So if you can do daily practice, you're taking care of your nutrition and the next thing would be getting some exercise. So as a single mom, I, um, I had some little bikes for my kids. I had a bike for the big kid and a baby seat on my bike. And I would take the bikes out and we would go get a sandwich at Subway. And I could feed all three of us for like $12. And by now it's like some years later. So it'd probably be, I don't know, $16 to ride our bikes. And um, used bikes, used baby seat, the whole thing. I did not have money and I grew up poor. So I know what that's like. Um, but at the time, I remember feeling lonely and like, I have to take care of my kids all by myself. But I look back and I actually, those were very happy times when I was learning to care for myself and the kids in a good way with what I had. So I just send you all my blessings. If I could hug you, I would. Um, I'm rooting for you and I hope the community, like, please encourage this woman. She needs your encouragement right now. And she's not broken. You are not broken, Jennifer. You're not broken. You're injured. PTSD, C complex PTSD is an injury, but it's not who you are. It's an injury just like if somebody uh, went to uh, combat and lost a leg. Many of our friends have, you know, lost a leg or an arm, had a serious injury. It's an injury, but it's not who they are. It's not who they are. They are still them. You are still you. So we're here and I hope to, you know, I would love it if you came to one of my daily practice calls and said hello and introduced yourself as Jennifer, because of course it's not your real name. But I'd love to say hi to you and welcome you. We talk a lot on this channel about limerence, and that's the state of obsession and infatuation for someone who feels like they are the answer to everything in your life, but they're not actually in your life. They could be a celebrity or imaginary or fictional, or you know them, they might even be an ex but they cannot or will not be with you. It's not possible. So there's just this perpetual longing that becomes like an addiction. It's easy to waste years retreating into the fantasy of being with your limerent object when being with them isn't possible. So there's a way out and it's time we talk about what happens after limerence. So my letter today is from a woman I'll call Jessie and she writes, Hi Anna. Thank you for your videos. I'm writing to you because I've been experiencing a lot of shame as I come out of my fog and realize the way I used to treat people. I was scapegoated as a kid from a lot of different sources and I've been experiencing a lot of social trauma and abandonment wounds, which have made it really difficult to connect with people in any kind of lasting way. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough <laughs> to be, quote, adopted into a pretty close-knit community of musicians in my hometown shortly after high school. And over time, these people became like family to me. When I first started spending time with them, I hadn't started my recovery yet and developed limerence for a guy who had also been adopted by this community, and it lasted for years. Luckily, I was able to pull myself out of that attachment, but the shame of knowing how uncomfortable I made him for a while, paired with the fact that so many people close to both of us are aware of how creepy I used to be, has become so sticky for me emotionally that it's 
really getting in the way of me moving forward. This guy has been nothing but really kind to me, and he's since gotten into a really good relationship, which I'm genuinely glad about. My friends have continued to be kind and supportive, but the shame from the past and the fear of developing limerence again in the future has kept me from both starting new relationships and really connecting with the people who are in my life already. All I want to do is make amends with the people I've hurt and treat people with kindness and respect. And I, I don't know why I'm having so much trouble doing that. Any help or advice would be really appreciated because I've been feeling really stuck and I'm ready to finally move forward. Thank you so much, Jesse. All right. I was circling things along the way in your letter that I wanted to come back to. I wanted to read it all so we could just kind of hear what's going on. But let's do another reading because I think I can help you, Jesse. Okay. You were scapegoated as a kid from a lot of different sources, and you've had a lot of social trauma and abandonment wounds. Oof which have made it really difficult to connect with people in any kind of lasting way. Mm -hmm. That is so common, Jesse. It's so common. So, you know, you touched very briefly on what happened, but scapegoated, meaning you were blamed for stuff that wasn't your fault. You weren't accepted. You weren't loved or appreciated or just, you know, you're great like you are. That'll do it. That's enough to break down your connection, your ability, your natural ability to connect with other people, to be yourself, to see who they are, to have an instinct for the right thing to say and do. So it creates this huge discomfort. And those are conditions. And the loneliness that go with that, that's where limerence can spring up. OK. So you were adopted into a pretty close-knit community of musicians in your hometown right after high school. And over time, they were like family. I'm so happy you have that. And I totally get that you would fall for somebody in that group. When you first started spending time with them, you hadn't started your recovery yet and developed limerence for a guy who had also been adopted by the community. So I, you don't say this, but I'm just guessing like you would have been willing to be in a relationship with him, but he wasn't. I'll tell you, for people with CPTSD with a great big attachment wound, the, the very fact that someone's attractive but not interested, that is the perfect storm to just fall head over heels for them. Because if they were available, what happens when you have this wound? What happens is you're like, oh, I don't know. This is entirely too possible. You don't think that consciously. But actually dealing with people and being close to them, it is something that will bring up whatever you've got hidden inside. It's going to just unsurface all that buried stuff that you had to bury as a kid. And that's what your recovery is now. You're, you're allowing yourself to flow and be yourself. I'm not like somebody who always is like, oh, you have to go into great analysis and excavation of this stuff. But the techniques I teach for healing include two times a day, taking your little dusting brush to start taking that top layer of memory and bad feeling off of whatever is up right now today. You do that twice a day for as many years as I have, you're like moving down through the, <laughs> you know, the millennium of all the stuff you're carrying and the, just the layers of hurts and beliefs and distortions. And all of it's going to come up eventually when you're in recovery. So it's so good that you're doing this. When you have less of that, then your natural desire to be close to somebody has a little more breathing room. And you're, while you're learning that, the self-defeating behaviors that can often push people away, it's like even if you're, if you're pushing that self-defeating behavior down, what happens? You're self-suppressing. You know, it's like so terrifying to have CPTSD. It's like you go to a party and you're like, oh, God, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to say something. I'm going to offend people. I'm going to get into some argument. Somebody's going to be mad at me. And so you self-suppress. And especially around romance, because that just, you know, that's just like when you fall for somebody, when you express that, oh, you know, I'm into you. Are you into me? There's just this tunnel where they can just go in there and just like, oh, you know, hurt you. Right. Not on purpose. They don't have to want to hurt you, but just to like love and lose. It's horrible. Right. And that's pretty much mostly what happens when you have unhealed CPTSD. So sometimes you'll find people who are they're not into you. Um, so you can love them from afar. That's kind of a nice way to sort of like experience the feeling of love when you can't handle more than that. Or you get together with people that you don't really like and you have some security, but that nagging feeling that this isn't really the one will continue to haunt you. So you're doing okay. 
you felt it, you got through it. Now, I actually love what you're doing, Jesse, this feeling of like, I'm not like, I'm not saying you should feel ashamed, but I just totally understand the feeling of shame. You're just, because you woke up, you woke up and you realize what effect this has on other people. And you feel like it, it wasn't realistic and other people witnessed it. I just know that so well. And I love you for being in that place. It's a good place. It's a noble and holy place to just start to reckon with what's really true. And so now you have this feeling of, of shame. You want to make amends. That's actually the good part of you, you know, kind of coming up like a little toddler, like, I want to fix it. I want to fix it. And so you shall, but you need not feel ashamed. It's not your fault. Limerence is not something you chose or did to yourself. It's something that happens to people who are severely emotionally neglected as kids and who um, it usually happens when your current life conditions are sucky. You know, you just don't have anything fun going on. Or I think in your case, something really wonderful happened. You got into this community. And so, you know, whenever things are like in transition like that, it's a big change and you're vulnerable. And so that is a time when you might sort of go, I don't know, you know, maybe I could be more than I ever imagined I could be. And here's somebody that I just think is so amazing and I must have them. <laughs> and then you can't. That's hard, but it's life. It happens to everybody. And so you being in reality about this and just feeling kind of uh, about it, that is the healthy part of you just recognizing it for what it is. Now, I don't know, you say that you hurt people and you don't really say anything that hurt people. You're worried you were creepy. I think the biggest amends you can make in this situation is just not doing that anymore and exercising a real detachment when you kind of want people to feel a certain way, whether it's to love you back or to believe that you're good or not think that you're an idiot, you know, <laughs> like trying to make people just feeling upset about how people feel about you or feeling like, mm, like you're always kind of steering it somewhere. That's just weird. That's what creates awkwardness. So you being yourself, you having a sense of humor about it, I think, I think having a little sense of humor is good if you really over it. Now it's rare that somebody would get limerent on somebody else and and then become totally neutral to them. But I think that this embarrassment actually is the healing power, the energy of healing coming in and just kind of like breaking the spell because limerence is like being charmed. It's like you're, you know, a magic spell is you're just like, oh, I can't, I can't believe anything else. And then boom, you wake up. So you're awake now. So hopefully if that's easy for you to be around, except for the shame, if you do want to make amends, here's the thing. The guy you say he's in a good relationship right now. And I just remind people like there are many apologies we can make, but when somebody is in a relationship or even might be like, let's say it was somebody you lost contact with and they might be in a relationship. The amends is not to keep having contact. And I know, um, you know, I've been limerent. I've had people get limerent on me and the people who have been limerent on me, like the last one who did that, I had to call the cops. I would be very upset and would call the cops again if I heard, if I heard from this guy. Ugh. And I always have to think, oh, he probably watches my videos and stuff and I can't help it. But you know, oh, it's just horrifying to me. I don't like it. It's wor it's creepy. It's beyond creepy. Right. Um, and I don't welcome it. And if there's any sort of amends to be made there, it's like, please stay away. Please don't do that anymore. So if there, if there was any of that, now you say this guy's been friendly to you. So I don't think that my thing, I, I, I've, I've had it, I've seen it, I've experienced it. I've been on both sides of it with people where it's basically friendly later, but I still think you have to keep like a really strong neutrality, propriety around it because the energy of it, the energy of that like unrequited love thing is very upsetting to your potential partner and his current partner or potential partners. It's just very upsetting. It kind of rocks the boat and it's respectful and it's healthy to just sort of like shut that baby down. It is. And a lot of people will say, oh, well, what's the harm? You know, it's just like a little fantasy. It's like, well, if you have a fantasy like four times a year for 10 minutes, okay, fine, have your fantasy. But if it starts to be where you can't have actual closeness with real people, there it is. Now that's why limerence exists is to compensate for that inability to connect. So the solution is, is to start working on that ability to connect. And I really just highly recommend 
doing it with people who are super neutral and understanding for you. I got so much help out of Al-Anon, you know, going to 12 step rooms where other people were working on stuff. They didn't all have the same issues as me, but there were some who did. And having friends who I could be connected to. But here's the thing, when Princess Diana died, I think a lot of us felt really sad about it and also kind of like identified with her a little bit um, of being somebody who had grown up, you know, with a crappy childhood and it turned out so terribly badly for her. And we all got together and we just got a bunch of yummy food and we all sat around the TV, like 10 of us all snuggled up to watch TV. Like that's, that was so healing for me, just having the kind of friends who you could do that with. And, you know, we, we just had a close bond and we laughed and, the only thing that ever messed that up was um, me or anybody else kind of just getting all messed up about some romance again. <laughs> that would, it takes you out every time, right? When the right thing comes along, it doesn't disrupt your happiness. It doesn't disrupt your stability. It sort of comes in slowly and adds to it. So you'll know it when it comes. You are now getting ready for that. But practice, and I don't mean to say that friends are just practice and then to be discarded or anything, but it's a little more neutral, not as charged, not as like, it's not going to lead to limerence. It's very unlikely to. And it's a way for you to learn to love. That's what we're here on earth to do, to learn to love. When will we ever learn? We're working on it. And getting over limerence is a huge way to take a step on that. So I'm proud of you. Um, this is very good what you're doing. Keep going. Um, if you want some support in our community, we have a whole bunch of people who are healing from limerence. They do the daily practice together. In our membership community, there's like peer-led daily practice calls three or four times a day, different time zones. It's really wonderful. We talk all the time about shame, toxic shame, getting shamed, shame spirals, fat shaming. But what do you actually do about shame? Depending on who you ask, shame is just something that other people put on you or that they do to you, and then maybe you internalize it. But I believe it's more of a mix. It's shame like that, the kind that comes from other people's judgment, and then the kind that is earned, <laughs> if you will. Shame that we genuinely feel about things we regret, things we said or failed to say or ways that we acted. And these two kinds of shame, when they get mixed together, they're confusing and they get tangled up into kind of a toxic mix that's really hard to take apart. But if you can break them apart, if you can put them in two piles, what other people think is wrong with you, what you where you think you fell short, you can start to detoxify that shame. You can sort it, take action on the things where you wish you could have done better. And, you know, it's not your fault that you were hurt as a kid or that it became hard for you to handle yourself in the best way possible. That's really normal. But we don't want to walk around in that toxic cloud of shame, either denying that there's anything wrong or completely like turning it against ourselves. We want to be real about it. So no matter what we've done, the best thing that we can do is clear it up. And the more you work on that, the, the earned shame, the part that you actually feel bad about, the more that toxic cloud just kind of loosens up and, and evaporates and you break out of that confusion. And for whatever reason, being clear and feeling better about yourself just kind of repels. It just pushes away that judgment from other people. Or if they do try to shame you, it just doesn't get internalized because you know that your house is in order. And wouldn't that feel good? I'm Anna Runkle, also known as the Crappy Childhood Fairy, and in this video, I'm going to lead you in a guided relaxation. It's not a meditation exactly. This is relaxation where you will have your eyes open most of the time, and you may even be writing some. And I'll help you take some easy steps to notice where you're feeling shame, and then to kind of sort it into those two piles I talked about, where you can start to see what's going on, and then loosen the grip of the, both kinds of shame and you'll come out of this with an action plan, all right? So to get started, you'll need a pen and paper where you can make some notes. And ideally, you would want a big full-size pad of paper with a firm back so that you can, you can write while you're sitting somewhere comfortable, a bed, a, a chair, a sofa. And it's totally fine if there's some noise around. You just maybe want to turn off your notifications so you can focus for a little while. And you're just giving yourself time to consider where you might be holding some shame in your mind. So now that you're sitting and you've got your pen and paper in hand, I'd like you to close your eyes for a moment and just kind of feel the weight of your body in the chair and your feet on the floor. 
and just take a few moments there to feel yourself here in present time. Not remembering much necessarily, not looking for things, not anticipating what this exercise is going to be about, but just kind of hanging out and just feel yourself being right here, right now. That's your, that's your power position. Okay, now open your eyes and see if you can just keep feeling yourself in the chair. Just kind of stay with yourself, not getting dysregulated, not worrying about how you're going to do this. Just feeling easy in yourself, breathing in and out. And now I want you to take the pen and paper, open your eyes and write ways that other people have made me feel ashamed. Okay. You're going to be thinking of things and writing them down that bother you. And it's nothing to fear. It's just a list of things that already bother you. You don't have to bring up anything dreadful or conjure anything that will be sufficient to put on the list. Just, you know, ways that other people have made you feel ashamed. You can write big general things like people think women my age don't know anything about technology. And now I dread asking questions on support calls. <laughs> I have that. And you might also write very specific things like um, person X told everyone I was difficult to work with and people stopped inviting me to be on teams. Or Sharon in second grade said I was stupid. You can be specific like that, but just stuff where other people made you feel ashamed and it affected you enough that you even remember it now. So just take some time to write things other people have done and said that make you feel ashamed. If you're over the shame, don't worry too much about it. You can use this time to just write the things that still have a little like charge in them that are still bothering you. Okay, so just get three or four ways that you've felt shamed before. And if you have more, that's fine too. They don't need perfect grammar. They don't have to be handwritten nicely. Just jot them down. And I'll give you a moment to do that. And then I invite you to close your eyes for a moment to just see if any other ways you've felt shamed pop into your mind. You don't need to get them all right now, but if it's in your mind, write it down. Try to have two or three at least. More is okay. It doesn't need a lot of detail. And then open your eyes. And sitting with your eyes open, I invite you to take a new piece of paper. And on this one, you're going to be writing things that you feel you did that make you feel ashamed. So maybe you know very well you feel ashamed about something you said or did, and you can write those things down. Maybe you're a bit fuzzy on whether your feeling of shame is appropriate or not. And actually, it doesn't matter if a memory or thought causes you to feel you did something wrong. Just go ahead and write it down. Just hang out just gently with those thoughts. We're not getting into fixing ourselves or being mad or anything. Just write it down. Don't worry too much whether you've got it all, whether it's right. These are just things that bother you because you feel you did something wrong. Okay? I'll give you some time to do that. Okay, so you have two lists. Now, if you think of something that really belongs on the first page, the one where you're listing how others have made you feel ashamed, you can move it over there, no problem. You can add something, you can cross it off. And then vice versa, if you think of something that really belongs better on the, the ways that you feel ashamed of your own actions, then you can move it over there, add it, cross it off, whatever you need to do. You can think of it like cleaning out a drawer full of rags that you're going to sort into two piles, right? The ones that are yours and then the ones that came from somewhere else. And you're going to lay them out and see where they go. And as you're writing the things that have made you feel ashamed, if you tip over into any kind of mental attack on yourself, just pull back from that. Writing these things down is something that you're doing to change your life so that you can feel good about yourself. Facing doubts and the things we regret is the way out of shame. It's positive. You're doing something very wholesome and responsible for yourself and, and for everyone you encounter, really. Hiding from that vague sense of shame is just a way to feel bad and be stuck. And you being stuck doesn't really do anyone any good. So don't use this to attack yourself, all right? Go ahead and take these two pieces of paper, one in each hand, and just hold them a minute, just lightly in your hands. And this represents your good intentions to be freer. And you might do this exercise again sometime, or you might sit down after this video is over and keep going. But for right now, you've named a few things that make you feel ashamed on two pieces of paper. 
And I want you just for a moment to focus on the other people list and just read it over. Okay. It may not be pleasant and just read it over. See how you feel about that. Is it good to write it down? Is it unpleasant to read it? I want you to just appreciate that you've got those shame items like out of your mind and onto paper and that's progress. So take that piece of paper, set it down and just say, okay. All right. And then sit for a moment, eyes open or closed and let your attention come over to the list of things that you feel that you've done the me shame. All right. The things that you've done that caused you to feel ashamed of yourself. So maybe you said something sharp to someone that's pretty common with CPTSD. Maybe you've let some aspect of your life get messy, something about your health or your money or your relationships. And that's also very common with CPTSD. It's hard to avoid, but there comes a time, and this may just be that time for you, that you take some steps to stop making those mistakes or to clear up any hurt feelings that you may have caused. So you wrote two or three things down. If you have more, that's fine. Whether or not the things you wrote are really true or not, you don't really have to know right now. Whether the list is incomplete doesn't matter. It's just, just assume there's going to be more as time goes by. But this is your good work to try to bring your awareness to things that you've done or said that you think maybe you don't feel right about. And that is what good people do. They reflect on their own actions periodically to see if there are ways that they might heal that. If there's a sore point, if they need to amend a hurt that they caused another person. So just know that you're doing something very positive. All right. For yourself and everybody who, who comes into your sphere. And what you might notice is that there's one item on the list of things you've done that you are today in a position to improve. Maybe you could take care of something that you've been delaying on, or you could apologize to somebody you've been avoiding. Or you could make a decision to stop a self-defeating behavior that made it onto your list. You don't have to choose anything, or if you do, it doesn't have to be the biggest thing on the list. But if you can find one small action that you can take today to start clearing that list, it, it might even be to take something off your list because you realize you didn't do anything wrong and you don't actually feel badly about it. But you are doing something very good here. And so I want to give you a big virtual hug just for being willing to do it. Even if you have no idea what you're going to do about any of this shame, you don't have to know that yet. You've just written it down and it's going to come to you gradually day by day. All you have to do is keep this with you, look at it every day and take a small action. Just keep chipping away at it. And soon you'll find that you feel a lot more lighthearted. The less shame you feel, the easier it is to clear up more items on the list. So small steps taken daily help you chip away until it's very short or gone altogether. Now, what about the other people list? You can keep that one with you too for a while. And if you like, you can add to it, you can change it, you can cross things off. You'll find that some things just fade away once you've given your attention to them. But the main thing that's going to cause things to drift off of this list is the work you do on this list, on the things that you feel. And that's the secret of losing shame by working on the stuff that you actually needed to resolve. All this free floating shame that you're sort of vague about other people judging you. Maybe you, there's something really terrible about you. It just tends to drift off. Okay. The list gets shorter. It's lighter and soon it's gone. So you're a good person for facing these things. And one thing that you can do to support yourself in this process of inner house cleaning is to use my daily practice. If you haven't learned it, these are two techniques. It's a writing technique and a simple form of meditation that I teach in a free course. And I'll put the link to that below so you can access that if you want. But this is something I share as much as I can because these are the techniques that I use twice a day to just calm stress, to lower the PTSD symptoms and to get more clarity. The daily practice is kind of like WD-40. It's, you know, that spray you put on rust. It loosens things up where you, where you used to feel stuck or hurt and it makes way for fresh new ideas to come in and stuck spots just tend to dissolve.